Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Kambi Zranavardi, a Columbia DC board member and a graduate of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Uh, first, I would like to thank our partners for, for this evening, uh, MIT and uh, Harvard Clubs of Washington, DC, as well as Asian Columbia Alumni Association and their members for joining us. Uh, very privileged uh, to have uh, this evening Dr. Andrew Lane, Percy K. and Vida L. W. Hudson, Professor of Biomedical Engineer, Engineering and Professor of Radiology at Columbia University. Also, Dr. Austin Chiang, Chief Medical Officer of the GI Business at Medtronic, uh, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Thomas Jefferson University to talk about uh, artificial intelligence and their impact uh, in transforming the healthcare. And this would be in a uh, uh, conversation with uh, Dr. Francis Oniemba, gastroenterologist and also a uh, fellow board member at Columbia DC. Uh, please allow me to briefly introduce our panelists, uh, but I do encourage everyone to, uh, to check our website for uh, getting a uh, more complete uh, uh, view of their accomplishments. Dr. Lane is uh, the director of the Hefner Biomedical Imaging Lab at Columbia. Uh, his focus is on uh, mathematical analysis and quantification of medical images, signal and image processing, computer-aided diagnosis, and biomedical imaging informatics. Uh, an algorithm that Dr. Lane developed based on a multi-scale wavelet representation is actually currently used in almost all of the commercially available uh, mammography systems. Uh, his work is based on imaging structures at various levels, at the molec uh, molecular, cellular, tissue, and organ level of analysis. And his ultimate goal is to, uh, to transform healthcare by uh, using this um, uh, pioneering biomedical te technology and AI to fill in the gaps, uh, functional and uh, quality gaps in existing commercial products uh, for healthcare. He's a fellow of IEEE and also a fellow of the International Federation for Medical and Biological Engineering, as well as um, uh, being a member of the Columbia's Data Science Institute. Uh, Dr. Austin Chiang is a gastroenterologist and advanced uh, endoscopist. Um, he is the first uh, chief medical officer of the GI business for Medtronic, uh, which is the world's uh, leading medical device company. Uh, his interests include novel uh, endoscopic weight loss treatments, as well as complex interventional endoscopic procedures, including the diagnosis and treatment of various GI conditions. He is currently an assistant professor of medicine at uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson University Hospitals in Philly and serves as the director of endoscopic weight loss program there. I uh, also want to mention that he is uh, one of a uh, few triple board certified advanced endoscopy trained physicians in the world. And last but not least, our, uh, our host, uh, Dr. Francis Oniemba, is a gastroenterologist, and as I mentioned, a fellow board member at Columbia DC. Um, her interests include uh, health communication and innovative programs and practices within healthcare. Uh, previously, she was uh, at the University of Maryland Medical Center treating patients with esophageal diseases and GI mobility disorders. Um, she completed her uh, medical degree at Columbia University School of Physicians and Surgeons before um, coming to Johns Hopkins to complete her internal medicine residency and uh, her fellowship in GI mobility and neurogastroenterology. And uh, I would like to also mention that in 2019, she was selected into the Young Physician Leadership scholars program for her leadership development and physician advocacy by the American College of Gastroenterology. Uh, without further ado, um, Francis, it's all yours. Thank you, Kambis, for that introduction. Andrew and Austin, it is wonderful to see you guys again, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, before we get started, I'll just re-clarify, as Kambi said, I'm Francis Onyimba. My role is just as moderator, but also as an end user of AI applications in healthcare. And I wanted to have this conversation tonight because to me, AI is everywhere. And for some reason, when we think about AI in terms of interacting with Siri and Alexa, it's normal. 
But when people start to think about AI in healthcare or AI as their doctor, all of a sudden it's a, it's a foreign concept. And for many, it can be a little bit jarring. So I wanted us to have a discussion about where we currently are, where we're headed, how we get there. And importantly, should we get there? A little bit of housekeeping for those viewing from home. We want this to be interactive with everybody. We will have a dedicated session for your questions and answers. As the questions come to mind, feel free to go to the bottom of your screen and enter them into the Q&A box. And at the end, we'll try to get to as many as possible. So we have two super experts with us on the topic tonight. And I just want to start out by getting a little bit personal. How did you even find yourself in this space? We'll start with Austin and then Andrew. Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining. Um, to be honest with you, I sort of fell into this space <laughs> with my role at Medtronic, but um, it was actually, I've been in this role for a year now, and part of the decision for me to take on this role was actually the fact that um, we are first to market with the first sort of AI-assisted um, device in gastroenterology when it comes to colorectal cancer screening. So, um, seeing kind of the direction that we're going in our field, uh, that's what sort of got me excited. And, uh, and you know, I've been learning a lot along the way. I'm admittedly not a data scientist or an expert like Andrew here. Um, so I'm also here to learn as well and to just exchange ideas with everyone. Wonderful. Um, and Austin and I were in med school together, and now he's on to bigger, better things on the industry side. And we'll hear a little bit more about the work that he's actually doing, but a lot of these views are, are his views. And that brings us to Andrew. How did you find yourself in this space? Well, it's it's been a long road, but uh, I've been working in the field of medical image analysis for over 30 years now. And during that time, we use traditional statistical methods to analyze images and sort of do what deep learning algorithms do right now so efficiently and uh, and better, quite frankly. Um, and so more recently, part of the last 10 years, as deep learning algorithms have had a renaissance, uh, you know, we've been shifting over to those methods and, and, and been very, uh, very pleased. The reason we didn't do that when I was a student earlier, was we didn't have the hardware. We didn't have GPUs that were that could compute so fast as we do now. So what we're sort of witnessing now is a synergy of a combination of well-designed algorithms or methods, but backed up by very well-designed hardware that, I could, that actually can train these deep models very efficiently. So it's, it's an exciting time, and I, I hope I can convince you that uh, it is, uh, a good thing. <laughs> okay, and we look forward to hearing more about your work very soon. Um, but when I was thinking about this event, I think one of my aha moments about AI was something that might have happened to a lot of us where, you know, you're on your smartphone in the photos app, and there is a memory video that somehow pops oh. up and was somehow <laughs> created, right? And it, And it's, the, the software is scanning thousands of images on the phone and pulls up pictures of somebody's children and pairs that with the appropriate song to evoke emotion and then has a title that says growing up and has effectively <laughs> diagnosed what all of these images mean and put it together in a way that then had an emotional connection, which I thought was fascinating. And my first experience was, oh, that's sweet watching the video. And then I felt that's kind of creepy, right? Which is a, <laughs> a response that a lot of people have with these trust issues with, with uh, the AI systems. And then I asked myself, how? Like, how is the, this technology on my phone actually doing this? So I know you've prepared some slides for us to break down what it means to have an AI system, what goes into it. And I'll hand it over to you to break down the technical aspects for us. All right, great, great. Thank you, Francis. So I hope, um, let, me, let me share my screen. I I probably have too many slides yet, so I'm going to go pretty fast. Okay. Um, but I want to sort of, uh, you know, the, unfold the black box that AI may appear to some that are not familiar with it, and hoping that by showing what's inside the black box, you'll be more confident in understanding. I think knowledge sheds light, so in that spirit. Um, so if we look back, uh, 
A AI was sort of began in, in the 70s as a rule-based systems later evolved into machine learning algorithms where statistical methods were applied uh, to, uh, to uh, analyze images to accomplish image that's called image uh, segmentation and classification. And then the deep learning models that we're going to talk about tonight really were based on biological in inspiration. And so there's, if you look at a timeline uh, in terms of the evolution, you know, the machine learning and deep learning go back to the 1940s of McCulloch and Pitt that looked at neural models, constructing functional gates for predicate logic. And uh, later Wood Woodrow Rosenblatt and Hoff developed learning methods. But in the 19, mid, mid 1960s, there was sort of a battle going on between Martin Minsky at MIT and Fred Rosenblatt at Cornell. They both had different views on what the future of AI should be. And um, uh, Ro Rosenblatt was more of a, of a biological uh, approach uh, supporter, whereas Marvin Minsky was more sort of typical computer science, uh, if and else statements, we can just talk to a person, analyze how they think and capture knowledge that way. And so he wrote a book called The Perceptron. Uh, and this sort of pointed out uh, that, you know, these models that were proposed by uh, uh, Rosenblatt and others um, were sort of fun toys, but they really weren't really going to go anywhere because it couldn't solve the exclusive or problem. So that's a, a logic that uh, really condemned neural networks and other models for decades. And this sort of fell into what's called the dark age of, of AI winter, where these really algorithms really never, never really progressed much. And then around mid-1980s, mid there was uh, the discovery of, of the back propagation, which could, in fact, train a perceptron model, a multi-layer perceptron model, to solve the, the XOR problem. And boom, we have this sort of renaissance of deep learning that emerged probably from 1986 to the present day in that sense. So, so just, I'm, not, I'm gonna go really quickly here because I don't have much time, but you know, as I mentioned, the Rosenblatt- could you, yeah. Andrew, could you yeah. uh, go into slideshow mode? These slides are great. I'm just wondering if they could be a little bit bigger and easier. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I forgot about that. Okay. Thank you. Is that, uh, that's better, right? Okay. Yes, yeah. Oh, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> It's been a long day. <laughs> anyway, so, so this is the biologically uh, neuron that inspired models. And as you know, there's a, a response based, based on chemical reactions where some potential will be released and a, a firing of the neuron will, will take place. So in the early days, this model was captured uh, very well and modeled mathematically where the ex exon reaching out, these exons can be very long, of course, in the brain, and they would con connect with a synapse, which is characterized by a weight, which is a value, and these would be summed together via what, what we see here as dendrites in the biological model. They would all be brought together with, an, with another neuron, and the sum of products collectively of these weights would, would be then propagated to, um, you know, to another, another uh, neuron on the pathway. So these were uh, uh, put together in a way such that uh, a multi-layered perceptron was possible. I'll point out that the uh, this activation function that seemed, let me go into my laser, laser pointer here, if I could get that more visible, you can see where I'm pointing to, yeah. So this function here could assume different values. It can be linear, it can be uh, sigmoidal, mathematically smooth, so many choices that one can do for this. And so the multi-layer per perceptron was really the first successful model and consists of input layers, hidden layers, and output layers. And this was sort of the beginning of, of deep learning. And the, the big sort of uh, icebreaker that, that gave rise to, to the renaissance of these methods was the back, back propagation model. And here we have a, a method of looking at the difference between a targeted value that we desire 
and the, the output value of what the network actually produces. And then we can modulate or update the weights. The weights actually define what the model is. So these collectional weights are very important. So as we modulate these weights, then we converge towards a, a better match between the input and the output. Um, we are able to uh, um, to accomplish tasks such as uh, the classification and so on. The loss function is also something that you'll hear about in models. This is very important because it defines how you compute the difference between your your targeted output and the actual value being computed at the weights themselves. And so this sort of a is a little video here. So we go forward in the network and we propagate these these weights. The weights are typically assigned random values to sort of kick off the model. And then we go back and we can iterate and adjust the, uh, the weights um, uh, with each uh, iteration going back and forth. And the first sort of model that, that demonstrated the classification was a challenge of looking at handwritten characters. And you can say these all shapes are, are all different because everyone's handwriting is different. And uh, the creation was called the Lynette model, which was a, a the first instance of a convolutional layered model. Um, and so we have uh, layer one, layer two. So when we go down to these layers, but by, by that I mean how deep is the network? And then at the very end, we usually have a model that mimics the multi-layered perceptron where, where everything is flattened and there's a, uh, a fully connected network at the very end that'll output what's, what's called a probability measure whether or not this, in this case, whether the character seven is in fact uh, the character that comes out on the output. So this was a, sort of a big deal and uh, it's been demonstrated that these networks are very successful at classifying objects like this. A more sophisticated type of model that you see today this is a VG19 model. It has 19 layers in it, but it's 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 pretty much the same thing that can be used to determine whether or not, for example, a uh, a chest radiograph would be a normal one, or uh, have pneumonia, or in some cases have uh, COVID. So, uh, so so there there are challenges that happen every year in this area that uh, they're really pushing the limits of classification. And um, uh, so in the state of, you know, this, every, every year there's a new challenge that I, I won't talk about. I, at the end, I have a slide. If you're interested, I can point you in that direction. So let's let's jump in, let's keep going and, and jump into deep learning. So as I mentioned, the machine learning is sort of the old way of doing things. And we we would, what's called hand extract a feature and then feed that into a, a classifier for an output. Now, deep learning, sort of the magic that happens in, in deep learning is that the feature extraction is built into the model itself. So we don't have to do anything. We just sort of let the model run and it will discover on its own the salient features that are needed to classify the object. And that's absolutely amazing. That, that's really the magic that happens. So for example, here, this is from the, the Goodfellow book. Uh, if we have an input layer seen here, which is a a color image here. What we see the early stages of the of the model. This is a uh, so when I when I say early, I mean the initial stages. And as they go up in the model, it becomes deeper. And what you see happen here, as you go deeper in the in the network, these features kind of pop out out of the convolutional process that happens at at each layer. And so this has been observed in the human visual system in area seventeen of the brain. We see the same type of edge detection happen, but in the deeper, deeper convolutional models, very complex objects, the what, what are called latent spaces, can be used to then combine uh, features uh, that that are self-derived and then used as ways to classify an object. So pre-processing is not to be is not again not to be discarded. Uh, um, I, I, I always tell my students if something can be made more simple, please do it. Here's an example of Cartesian coordinates that is very hard to separate in a linear way, but if you convert them to polar coordinates and feed it into the model, it's a no-brainer just to sort of draw a line between them. So always keep in mind that uh, 
we, we can benefit from from pre-processing. So why why deep learning? What why is what's all the big fuss about this? Why are we excited about it? Well, the older type of algorithms, the algorithms I refer to regarding machine learning and old AI methods, the amount of data didn't really matter so much. But in deep learning, it does matter. The more data you have, the better quality data you have, that really can turn the corner and enable these algorithms to do superhuman things. So the power is the amount of data. And here you've got you know one dimension, two dimensions, but deep learning really shines as we get into multi-dimensional uh, spaces. And this includes some of the stuff that Francis, that you mentioned in terms of looking at pictures, looking at you know profiles of people, those are multi-dimensional data sets. That's why these deep learning algorithms can call that all together in a nice way. So again, I'm, I'm going very, very quickly here, but when we train a deep, a deep learning model, we have a hopefully a very good set of data for training. We don't want to have sort of garbage in, garbage out. We want to make sure we have pristine data that's high quality, gold standard type of data. We usually break it up into 60% for training, 20% for validation, which is used to tune the hyperparameters of a model. And then finally, we test it on data that, is, that, that the network had never seen during the training cycle. These, these two data sets have never seen during training, so they're kind of blind to that. And then there's other terms that you'll hear about in EPIC, and EPIC means you've presented all of the data to the network you know, through one cycle. Usually we can't do this, so we break it up into mini batches. And then it, uh, it, uh, iteration is, is a processing of, of the entire batch of data. So another key thing that you'll hear about in, in deep learning is this business of, you know, when do I know when to stop the training? I, I don't want to fall into a problem that's called underfitting, where it's just, uh, you know, not, not really performing at the level or, or overfitting where it's just sort of going in directions that really don't make sense. So underfitting is sort of memorization. So what we seek when we train a model is to find the minimal of during the validation testing and the minimal of training. And that's, that's the sweet spot that you wanna stop the network right there. Whatever weights exist at that time, that's your best model when you're off and running. So just to make you, just to remind you, so what I mean by underfitting is, you know, the model shown here uh, of points is really off. The blue line is sort of a linear approximation, not so good. Um, if you look at the other stream, when we overfit, you know, the model's going way up here, it's sort of deviating, it's, its cost function is very high, but the sweet spot is sort of when it, when the model pretty much aligns with the true function shown here in orange, and that's called optimal capacity. Um, as I mentioned, the, you know, the part of adjusting the parameters of a deep learning model is this observation of sort of fitting it to the, uh, to, to the most uh, uh, minimal representation. So, so these are these deep learning models are complex. They're large. They have millions of weights to them. And sometimes we want to reduce the complexity. We can do this by 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 what's called uh, dropout. And so this actually has been observed in biology. If you look at the synaptic density of the brain at birth and at six year old, as we get older, we actually cut some of those neurons. And so this can, this actually helps a deep learning model too because we can prune. Uh, the certain neurons rather than having a what's called a fully connected network here where every neuron is talking to every other neuron at the next layer we can s cut some of those, those those junctions or those synapses and the model actually performs better so and, let me make sure yeah, yeah. that i understand to break it down because i know that in our viewers and even just amongst the three of us there are different levels of understanding the the technology and the math that we're going over just to break it down on the most basic levels for those of us who aren't as familiar with uh, with computer science or engineering effectively what you're describing is a system that mimics what we know about the brain when it comes to the artificial neural networks and deep learning and the way that it's trained and so there are various, and I'm going to try to summarize and have you let me know if I'm correct or not. But when we talk about artificial intelligence, it's the ability for, for software and algorithms to, to be trained, to kind of analyze, collect data and analyze it and make some decisions as humans do or as, you know, cognition, kind of. 
And then within that, there is machine learning where you can get put in different data points and train it to recognize something based on the characteristics that you fed it. And then there's deep learning where the software and the algorithms can identify which characteristics are yes. important on its own. And that's the main differentiator. And that deep learning then can work with large data sets and actually thrives with very large data sets. Is that kind of correct yes. in terms yes, of breaking it down? Okay. Yes. So then I want to make sure that we have time to get to talking about the actual real-time applications that you've been working on and that Austin um, has been work have been working on. And then we can kind of fill in the blanks from there so that we can get to questions. But based on what you've presented so far and the fact that it really does work with larger data sets, that kind of leads us nicely into what the current clinical applications are. And I know for... For a radiologist, there was a study out of Mayo in 2015 where the average radiologist read an image every three to four seconds, eight hours a day. That's a tremendous amount of data <laughs> to have to sift through. I know if I see a patient who's had 15 years of symptoms, they're coming to me with over 300 pages of medical records that I need to sift through and find what's important. And in our 30 to 60 minute visit, integrate all of that, make a diagnosis and figure out the evidence-based data, evidence -based data that's applicable. And that's a lot for humans to do and the volumes are only increasing. My question for the two of you is, um, what do you think are kind of the, other than managing data overload, the benefits of using the softwares that you just, or the technologies that you just talked about? I'll start with Austin and then we can go back to Andrew. Um, I think that there's several different things uh, or reasons why, you know, AI could be beneficial. I think one of them is just improving the quality of studies. When I, when I think about, you know, um, and I'll talk about this in a little bit about in gastroenterology and improving the quality of kind of the procedures that we're doing, um, AI can really help with that. And um, I'll have an example of that. Um, it can also improve our efficiency and also kind of um, make sure that we're delivering care consistently. Uh, across the board. So, you know, standardizing care, making sure that, um, you know, around different parts of the country where maybe training may differ, uh, that, you know, patients are not going to get disparate care. Um, so those are just a few reasons I can think of. Okay. And Andrew? Yeah, I, I agree with all, all, all the above there. Uh, in other instance where AI is useful is what's called orphan diseases, where you have very sparse data, but you can, through AI, you can augment that data uh, to, to analyze those types of diseases more efficiently that couldn't be done. So, and also the models of, um, of bringing together large cohorts of, of data is possible for equity and for other diversity purposes. You're just not in a, in a, in a single hospital when you're training a model. So that's a very powerful place to be. Um, and there's, there's a, just a ton of applications in precision medicine, genomics, uh, breast cancer, uh, looking at raw, raw MRI data. There's actually very good models that can look at the uh, acquisition of a Fourier transform and, and uh, reconstruct the image with better reliability than it's done in the past. So there's, there's a lot, so there's a tremendous amount. Of, and all this leads to patient care. I mean, it's all about uh, saving lives, doing so, you know, not, you know, this was your mother being diagnosed. You want to have the absolute best technology on the table. And so that's what I think drives uh, us to, to push this uh, further down the road. If I can just piggyback on that, I think, you know, yeah, in addition to kind of image analysis, um, also kind of improving the efficiency of our clinical workflow. Um, natural language processing, I think, could be like, incredibly helpful, especially in our sort of document-heavy world, documentation-heavy world that uh, we live in, in healthcare. And as you mentioned, Andrew, kind of, I can, not within Medtronic, but kind of outside, um, even within, you know, pharmaceuticals and identifying drugs and you know, um, predicting, you know, which patients would respond more um, appropriately. I think 
you know, there's tons of applications. Yeah. I agree. And to speak about some of the things that you all spoke about in real time, what we've adopted where I work are some of the natural language processing technologies where, and generative language, where you're in a clinic visit with the physician and the patient, and the software can listen in on the conversation and use that to generate kind of a draft of the note without you really having to dictate or type as much as you usually would kind of like a scribe. Um, so the areas where we're seeing really an uptake of artificial intelligence in healthcare are various. Like you described drug development as part of it, just improving hospital systems operations. And you guys are gonna talk more about the clinical stuff, but really anywhere that's image dependent is where we're seeing gains. And that's where you both come into play. So Austin, can you tell us a little bit about kind of what Medtronic is doing with artificial intelligence for colonoscopies? Absolutely. Um, so I think just for uh, anyone on the call right now who might not be familiar with sort of colorectal cancer screening. So as you may know, everyone in the U.S. is recommended to undergo screening starting at age 45. That's for average risk individuals, you know, so not including people with a family history or underlying condition. There are various different screening modalities and colonoscopy being kind of a gold standard because we're actually able to visualize a precancerous uh, polyp or something that could potentially become cancer. And the whole goal is to remove it um, at the time of the procedure. And so, you know, just to give a little bit of context, the, the main metric that we go off of to determine the quality of a good colonoscopy is something we call adenoma detection rate or ADR, which basically is, you know, whether or not at least one polyp is detected, one adenoma polyp is detected during that colonoscopy. And there's a lot of reasons why we are missing polyps. And that's the fact of the matter is that a colonoscopy is not perfect. You know, we go in and often we don't see polyps or we miss polyps because of um, a poor bowel prep. It's, the colon isn't entirely cleaned out. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, we're not seeing it because of the location of the polyp. And sometimes it's just the fact that we fail to visualize or identify you know, that something is a polyp when in actuality there is something there. So what we um, have introduced is the first to market uh, device that was FDA approved um, within the GI space uh, uh, for this purpose. So this was uh, back in May of last year, 2021. And um, I can pull up a, a slide real quick just to show you kind of what it looks like. I don't know if you can make me co-host to share screen. Um, but while I'm getting access to that, uh, okay, great, thank you. Um, it's basically a box that sits on top of a, um, uh, a scope uh, apparatus. So actually, hold on one second here. I pulled away from that, so I will pull it up right now. Share screen. All right, hopefully everyone can see this. I'll put it in full screen mode. Um, so this is what it looks like. It's basically a box, kind of like a you know video game console <laughs> that um, hooks up with the scoping tower that we already use. And it's there are a lot of scoping uh, scope manufacturers out there. Um, and so it works with anything that's out there. And basically what you can see here on the screen is that automatically there is a green box that um, gets put around a precancerous polyp. And, um, and, you know, even though it's conceptually pretty simple, the computing power to be able to do this in real time while you're doing a procedure really um, had to come until, you know, nowadays for it to, to be able to come to fruition. So maybe I'm hoping that one of these videos will actually show you kind of in real time what it looks like. So it'll flash and show you the, uh, the polyp. And, you know, sometimes um, these can be quite subtle and, uh, and so the goal here is that we'll be able to remove it. So the stability of this box, box being put around that polyp is um, pretty, uh, has improved over time in part because, um, and I'm gonna stop the screen share here, uh, in part because we now have 13 million images that it's going off of um, to help, uh, you know, um, with the identification of these polyps. And, um, 
you know, we're on to kind of the third generation of the software now. And so basically how it works is that um, it can be, uh, the box can be updated through a USB drive. It's not kind of a real time thing, just given FDA regulations here. And multiple centers across the U.S. have outfitted their systems, you know, in terms of private practices or uh, even the VA um, signed an agreement recently uh, and some other big academic centers as well. So the improvement that we're seeing in that metric that I mentioned, adenoma detection rate, is an increase of 14 percent from um, a, a baseline of 40 percent. And I'll point out that the sort of benchmark uh, here in the U.S. is a 25% adenoma detection rate. So we are able to significantly improve that. And what that means is that every 1% increase in adenoma detection rate, that quality metric, there's a 3% decrease in the incidence of colorectal cancer. So, um, you know, presumably we're able to, uh, you know, better detect polyps so that we can prevent colorectal cancer from happening. And there's a lot of other sort of metrics that have been looked at in terms of, you know, adenoma miss rate and things like that, or the false negative rate for people who previously were thought to have a negative colonoscopy, like if no polyps were found. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're seeing that there's also been models that have been built out, economic models to show that it's cost effective because basically by detecting things early, you can prevent uh, the sort of massive costs associated with cancer care, whether it's hospitalization, chemotherapy, you know, imaging, et cetera, that goes into, you know, um, taking care of a uh, patient with cancer um, through the rest of their lifetime. And one other thing that I want to point out real quick is that, you know, at this time, given the sort of attention to health equity, um, I think the timing is perfect uh, because we're able to really ensure that those image inputs are um, being collected in an equitable way so that, you know, what, what is being um, uh, generated is actually applicable to all groups uh, across the population and not just, you know, one or two groups. And we've actually um, also had an effort recently to try to introduce this technology, not only to uh, centers that are early adopters, but also to Kind of more underserved areas, rural populations through um, a partnership with one of our GI societies and Amazon Web Services to be able to provide these units. So we have 133 units across the country, um, including, you know, hospitals in the Indian Health System and other kind of uh, sites that don't often get new innovation. So super excited about that. Um, so the last thing I'll say is that you know, like I mentioned, this is a very simple concept in terms of putting a box around a uh, polyp, but there mm -hmm. are many, many more features that are kind of in the pipeline and um, and there are other players within the space. It's a huge area of interest within gastroenterology right now. All of our societies are focused on it. Multiple companies are focused on doing this, which I think is great because it just sort of um, generates more interest and, and hopefully, you know, will drive the whole field forward. But, you know, um, Without revealing too much, I think that uh, there's a lot more um, to come in this whole space, and not only just for colonoscopy, but the rest of the gastrointestinal tract as well. So as a patient, to give myself the best shot when it comes to cancer screening, I am looking for the, historically, I'm looking for the best specialist, the one who's done the greatest number of cases because they're more likely to find a small lesion or a lesion that could potentially turn into cancer. And that person isn't accessible everywhere. And effectively, this tool now equalizes the or levels the playing field a little bit more such that polyps that may have been missed can now be more readily detected and hopefully improve long-term outcomes, which is fantastic. And theoretically, something that would be easy to adopt and everywhere, but that's not the case for AI technology. So I, I want you to talk briefly about what are the barriers to implementation that you're seeing, and then we'll go on to Andrew, who can talk about his work on the research side and kind of what barriers he's seeing there. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a good point about kind of just having a leveling the quality out there. Even for one, a single gastroenterologist, there's a difference we know from people who get their procedure early in the day versus at the end of the day when the doctor's already tired and not paying as close attention. So, you know, even then we can see some improvement. But in terms of barriers to adoption, I think um, 
you know, we like to think that we're early adopters in medicine, but really we're not. And it kind of, uh, I think if we think about gastroenterologists, it's hard to convince doctors that they can do their job better. <laughs> and so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is just sort of getting the technology through the regulatory uh, pathway, you know, is very difficult. I think the FDA is still getting used to artificial intelligence, deep learning sort of um, in, in healthcare. And fortunately, there's some precedents out there in other fields like radiology, ophthalmology, et cetera, but they're still adapting. And, you know, I think inherently there's some, um, uh, there's some conflict there that needs to be resolved. Um, and then, of course, like, you know, um, cost is definitely another thing. And, um, and uh, you know, just getting used to the, te the technology um, over time. So several different barriers, but we have tried to make it as easy as possible. Just it's very much plug and play. The learning curve is really um, pretty much non-existent. And, you know, it doesn't really alter the way that you're actually doing the procedure, like mechanically speaking when it comes to doing a colonoscopy. Um, so, you know, from that angle, it, it should be easy for any gastroenterologist out there to start eating. Wonderful. Well, thank you for giving us a great example of the kind of product side of it. Andrew, can you tell us a little bit about your work on the, the research side of it that makes all of this possible? You're on mute. Okay, oh, sorry. I can share my screen, but before I do that, I noticed there were some questions that I didn't see. I apologize. Oh, no, no, no. It's okay. We have a dedicated question. Oh, we'll go back for that. Okay. And we will okay. go back to it. So okay. I just want to make sure that we actually have enough time to get to the gotcha. questions. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go quick then. Okay. Uh, so can I share the screen? Uh, I don't see it as an option for me here. Uh, you'll get access in one second. Oh, there, oh, there it is. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think this is the one. Let me again go into screen mode here. So, so I, I've been working in the area of lung imaging, COPD, for the last 12 years. And early on, we, uh, we were told by a, a gray-haired radiologist who had lots of experience. And so uh, that, you know, there were more than one type of uh, emphysema that existed in the lung. And so probably with this audience, I don't have to go through the anatomy here, but the disease is the destruction of alveoli that make up the lung parenchyma. And in terms of imaging, uh, this appears as darker regions within the lung. Fibrosis is a different disease uh, of, of thickening of the alveoli, but there are it's it's a unknown question, unknown answer whether or not COPD is is in fact a disease of the arterial system, uh, or in fact a small airway disease where uh, the airways will fill up. With, with mucus and and, uh, and actually collapse. But it's a very serious disease and it's the fourth cause of death in the US now. There is no cure for it. Uh, it grows at a very slow rate of about 0.6% a year. And it's actually worldwide, it's number three actually in, in, the, in terms of a killer. So it's a horrible way to, uh, to suffer. You basically suffer, suffocate uh, to death over a period of time, the organs will fail. And so we began looking at this uh, and we have very high quality uh, CT images that I'll, let me, let me jump into that very quickly. Again, this is sort of the physics of acquisition. It's a, a tomography and we can reconstruct the image. Uh, but what it appears as is a, let me put on my laser again here. Uh, it will show up as these sort of textured patterns within the lung. And it's been long acknowledged that uh, um, that there are uh, three types of it, uh, emphysema that can be detected, and so uh, and so we have we're very lucky that Columbia 
along with Johns Hopkins and other universities, a part of what's called the MESA uh, trial. So this is a very large cohort of patients that are principally a coming from a healthy population. On the other side, we have a diseased population from another cohort called spiromics. And these are gold standard databases that uh, have very high quality control. And uh, it's sort of a mixed, a mixed type of blessing because these uh, data, these data has been collected over sometimes over a 12 year period. So on the good side, we have massive prospective and longitudinal cohorts that enable deep learning methods to, to sort of learn the stages of a disease. So our, our intent here was to see if we can break down the stages of, of COPD such that interventions or drugs could be uh, introduced to stop the disease in its tracks or at least slow it down in some, in some sense. Because right now there's really, there aren't, there aren't any real drugs or therapies that can do that. Uh, so I've highlighted here in green, uh, the good side of things. On the other hand, uh, technology of scanners are always changing. So this is, this is what we have to deal with when you're uh, collecting data, large data sets over time, there are improvements to scanners, increased resolution. And so you have, you know, 10 years ago, it wasn't as good. So how do you harmonize this data? So data harmonization plays a big role in, in being able to make sure you're, you're leveraging and training your model the best way. Um, and so we, I, I collaborated with Dr. Graham Barr and Ben Smith. And so they published a paper showing that in fact, these three subtypes of, of emphysema uh, shown here, uh, central lobular, paraceptal, and pineal lobular emphysema are the dominant types. But as I mentioned, uh, there, there, were, there was a, a very senior uh, pulmonologist who swore that there are more than these, these uh, three subtypes. So our mission was to use deep learning to see if we could hunt and find the subtypes if they existed within this large cohort of data. So that was sort of the, the challenge. Could we identify these things that this very senior person, he's now retired. And so, but he, he swore that, 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 that he had seen the, these subtypes. And so, uh, so we published a paper that in fact, uh, last year actually, that actually showed this. And this is a, oops, this is a, a summary of that where we discovered not three, but actually 10, distinct uh, subtypes that were existent within these cohorts of MESA and in confirmed in spiromics. And furthermore, when we did a GWAS analysis on, on these subtypes, uh, there were three hits in terms of vascular disease that, uh, that, that suggested that uh, those types of emphysema may be related to, to, to uh, vascular disease as opposed to small airway disease. So that was very cool, and it's a it's an ongoing project. We are refining this uh, further down the road. We're also using deep learning to uh, improve screening. So here's an example where you know the standard method. I'm sorry uh, for screening. When you come in, uh, they'll take a, a CT chest radiograph and they'll use a simple method, just thresholding at minus nine fifty Hounsfeld unit. And what you see here in red is is uh, is that simple threshold operation. But I, I point out uh, on on the, on the left hand side, you'll see some charts where the original image in the year two thousand four, uh, and, so, and so over time, going to the right is uh, is the original image. But the the method where just blinded mi minus minus nine fifty, you'll see that all of a sudden the um, emphysema disappears. And we know that that's impossible. Emphysema never disappears. It's monotonically increasing. It only gets worse in time. And so our, our method that we've developed here is called eight, the HMMF method that uh, is in fact respectful of the uh, biological growth pattern that we would expect. Now, the problem with this method is that it was flawed in that it depended upon what's called the upper limit of normal. Um, which actually has a bias in it. And so we are using deep learning to, to get rid of this, this bias by looking at it in the entire ensemble again. 
And so it's uh, another example where you couldn't do this without without having these large data sets of high quality. So it's, I think I'll I'll I'll, I'll 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 stop here. We have another project related to looking at. Um, I'll just describe this. Uh, it's a new grant that we have looking at airway subtypes. So everybody's airway tree is different. It's like your fingerprint. And the uh, hypothesis is that um, if you are born with bifurcations that are very acute, you are more likely to have accumulations of uh, a particular matter as you breathe uh, that would cause uh, inflammation of the airways. And so that, that may explain why some people are ten, you know, heavy duty smokers, they never get any, any lung disease or others you know, get it right away. Maybe, so we're trying to uh, use deep learning to model a biological process of filling out the lobes of the lung and um, in measuring and then the subjects, the, the patients included in the MESA and spiromics, the actual tree structures of these patients and seeing if we can, can cluster them into tree subtypes. So much like, like oak tree or hickory tree, we imagine that humans have developed these different tree subtypes. There's not hundreds of them, maybe there's like 10 of them that, uh, that may exist. And those could be associated with risk factors. And so if you have this analysis done, we, then, we would then be able to tell a patient, hey, you have a very risky airway tree, you know, stop smoking, it's gonna be trouble. And so th this would at least identify the, the risk factor for that patient. I think that's actually a really great segue into a couple of the audience questions that we have because now you have, you're creating programs that uh, lead to clinical predictions. And then we can use those clinical predictions potentially to allocate healthcare resources and subsequently improve outcomes for patients. Um, I, I guess, again, these are all ideas that make sense when they're presented, but are complicated. So is the research being readily funded? Um, what are the barriers that you're seeing on your end to, to developing uh, further AI systems? Is that a question to me? Yeah. That's to you, yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, the funding part, um, they're not just going to fund you because you're doing AI anymore. It has to be a very well-focused problem with clear clinical benefit. And so as long as you can articulate that and show that, you know, the methods that you're proposing will get the job done, it's like any other grant. It's, it's a tough, <laughs> a tough, a tough audience. But, um, you know, there, there are not, I, I think there's been less and less uh, um, hesitancy to accept these methods as, as being uh, useful. And so in that sense, it's probably gotten better, I would say. There was a period where, you know, people were doubtful of these, you know, what's this thing deeper and what's the, you know, there were doubters that were questioning it and so on. But I think we've, the community has, uh, has been convinced by the results of the pretty hard hitting results that have been published. Thank you. I cannot let us have a conversation about AI and healthcare without continuing Austin's comments about uh, bias in the data that's used for training, bias in mm -hmm. algorithms, um, and that contributing to or exacerbating health inequities and inequalities. And we know that there have been some high profile cases that have discussed bias in AI outside of medicine, notably Amazon's uh, AI hiring tool that had discriminatory practices against women in tech based on the data that it trained with and the fact that it was a male dominated field. But we're also seeing some of that uh, within healthcare, when it, whether it comes to gender, color, socioeconomic status, that there have been degrees of uh, discrimination. And one example has been within dermatology, where neural there had been studies with neural networks that have high accuracy in skin lesion classification, and especially with melanoma being equal or superior to actual dermatologists. But most of the data sets that were used to train it 
were in white patients where the lesions appear very differently. Um, so that could ultimately lead to inaccurate diagnoses in skin of color, um, miss or under treatment of lesions within skin of, in skin of, skin of color and further exacerbate uh, the disparities that we see within healthcare. In your experience or your knowledge of the field, what are some of the tools we can use to combat this? Because we want to make sure that there's responsible development of AI systems, even though it's a very powerful and helpful tool, it's, it, it's flawed. How can we improve that? That's to either of you. Um, the answer that's you know, very clear to me, at least, is you have to have uh, multi-ethnic, uh, the database that you're training the model with has to be diverse. You know, it must be diverse to, uh, you know, to avoid those types of biases. And so that's why the, in fact, the, MA, the MESA's multi-ethnic uh, althesporosis type of study where it's sort of the, the Framingham study, which was done with white men only, the MESA study is an incredibly diverse population. And so if you design from the ground up, a, a database and collect samples of, of subjects that are diverse. The models that are trained with that database uh, will integrate and will average and will tease out and will be able to generalize those classifications of melanoma, uh, for example, across a wider variety of, of, of subjects, uh, ethnic backgrounds and women and men. Uh, if you, you shouldn't you know, there there are there are some databases that separate men and women for re reasons, but uh, you you can uh, I think avoid bias through deep learning. Yes. And Austin, you, do you want to elaborate on your previous comments? Yeah, I was just going to echo that um, that you know it's really only as good as the inputs are, but I feel like inherently there's many different constructs within medicine and healthcare that are biased that I think have to be rethought. You know, if we think about like GFR or other sort of things that like, I think um, it's an opportunity, I think for AI to sort of redefine um, uh, how some of these kind of um, classifications are and whatnot that historically are biased. So we're going to move on to the question and answer session with our very engaged audience, and I will try to get to as many as I can. Um, we're going to start out with a question that I think is interesting. The attendee asks, are there possibilities for problems when mixing AI and human intelligence in caring for patients, similar to driverless cars when mixed with actual drivers? I would say yes. Um, right. You know, the you know the physician of the 21st century, I think, needs to be literate in understanding uh, AI and engineering in, in general. I think there's more evidence of this in medical schools that happen at, at, at UT and other Michigan and other places. Uh, and so if you just treat the algorithm as a black box, and really don't understand what's going on, if you just believe it blindly, that's obviously a, a mistake. That's that's something. So you have to understand why why the algorithm may be fooled, and why you as the human should remain the final word in any clinical decision. And so I'm 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 all for using AI as a uh, assistant to help narrow down or, as Austin mentioned, improve, you know, throughput of reviewing radiographs at the end of the day uh, to avoid misses. I think all that's good, but the physician is, should be uh, the final uh, decision maker. Yeah, I was going to also say the same thing, basically like understanding the limitations of AI. And I think with regards to the question, it really depends on what the AI is. You know, if we're talking about like uh, an automatic robotic <laughs> device, I think it's different than like something that maybe, you know, use like a clinical calculator of some sort. So I think, or, or sort of some risk prediction model. Um, but 
I think when we, you know, it's actually, it's a legitimate concern, um, you know, but when I think about the example of like colonoscopy assistance right now, the way things are right now, it, it's interesting because some of the feedback that I have heard from some of my colleagues is that, oh, are, you know, is this going to jeopardize my career? Is this, um, you know, are ro robots going to take over for physicians? Is it going to make, you know, future gastroenterologists not as good at what they do? And I think it's really, you know, what we're emphasizing here is that it's purely a tool on top of what you're doing already. Like there's, I think, an element of clinical interpretation that um, is important because the AI only operates off of its inputs and there's so much that goes into that clinical scenario that has to be taken into account. So let me play devil's advocate a little bit because so far the both of you have talked about AI as a tool that we're currently using, but we know that this is a, something that its algorithms and its own self-training can evolve over time. And in the movies, we think of super intelligence or technological singularity, and it seems something that is super far-fetched, right? Like humans also need to always need to be in control of it. Our jobs as physicians may one day involve to just be AI managers, et cetera. But there was a article or a study that was published in Lancet looking at um, imaging and the ability for AI algorithm to determine race based on images where all of the racial data was completely removed. And, you know, we're just looking at a chest x-ray, can that software determine race? And the study was less so about actual race, but the ability of artificial intelligence. And what they found was that the software could determine a patient's race, self-reported race as black, white, or Asian when looking at chest x-rays, when looking at a CT of the chest, when looking at a mammogram. And after they have de-identified that information and they thought, well, that's strange, how is that possible? So then they did subsequent experiments to further get rid of confounders like bone density, disease distribution, and breast density. And still it was able to perform superiorly. And so they said, okay, well, let's change the image resolution to the point where it is no longer recognizable as an actual medical image to people. And it could still identify the race based on that. And so that study, the author had a, uh, they had a statement subsequently that I thought was very interesting. And he said, even when you filter medical images past where the images are recognizable as medical images at all, deep models maintain a very high performance. That is concerning because superhuman capacities are generally much more difficult to control, regulate, and prevent from harming people. And so to me, that was a little sneak peek into, well, is this something that's really going to be just a tool that we utilize, but what, or what happens if it does evolve to a point where we, we can't even quite understand how it's doing what it's doing? Yeah. yeah. Any comments on that? I don't know if you guys had, were familiar with the study previously. No, it, 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 it's, it, it's absolutely true. A former student of mine published a paper recently uh, looking at uh, MRI of the brain, and he could predict within uh, a year or two the age of the individual just by looking at the MRI brain slice. So yeah, these are real things there. These are superhuman algorithms, um, and they pick up on very subtle features that, that we do not, um, but it is a risk factor, and that'll be a challenge as we move forward in terms of regulation. All right, we have some technical questions that are clearly for you, Andrew, so. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. You do it the way you can. Uh, one question says, can a deep learning model discover that polar coordinates are better for clustering in your earlier example? And I think that was from your first set of slides. Sure, well, you wouldn't need a deep learning model to do that. I think you could use key, key means or traditional statistical uh, methods. Uh, you know, to show that, um, uh, you know, deep learning is, uh, is going to benefit from having the data that it's fed to be in a orthogonal or more, you know, pre-processed, you can use single value decomposition or something to orthogonalize the data vectors so that they're more s separated as, as an input vector. That always helps uh, the model. Um, so yeah, but I, I just meant to show that as a as a 
you know, when I was a student, my advisors always told me, anything you can do to pre-process the problem, do it because it'll it'll help you. And I think that's held that's held true over time. Yeah. Um, someone asked, what programming language is considered useful for AI? What other tools do AI researchers use? Well, we we use in our lab Python for the most part. There's there are different platforms. There's you know Google. Uh, has has their own platform, uh, but mo mostly Python. I would say Python is uh, by far the most common one that that I see being used. There's GitHub is a is a repository of public open access repository where if you wanted to build a model very quickly, you usually can go there and find a, a basic framework. You don't have to usually start from scratch. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, this next question is for you, Austin, about your slides about uh, GI genius and a couple of questions. One, they asked, does a little green box also have the ability to take pictures along the way to create a map of the colon for each patient so that you can compare the results between colonoscopies? That's a great question. So this device in and of itself doesn't have video recording capabilities, um, but you can bet that that's something that we're thinking about. <laughs> and so that's one of many other functions, um, you know, that are being considered right now. And what's the cost of the procedure, someone asks? So there's no additional cost to the patient. So this is really up to the facility or the physician to adopt the technology. And, you know, there is an economic argument for it because it, you know, that's kind of the revenue generation from it that we usually like to mention is sort of the increase in pathology detected, the shortening of surveillance interval, you know, um, and also kind of just the way that medical billing works in terms of uh, moving a diagnostic procedure to a therapeutic one if you have to remove a polyp. So, you know, um, it, it, it does check out in terms of cost effectiveness. So there's no cost, additional cost to the patient. Okay. And last, uh, I guess it's more of a comment along, about that technology. Even with the assistive AI, some of the detection would still be dependent on the user to also find the polyp with the scope. Yes, i.e. the technique of using the scope of the how the scope user maneuvers the scope. Uh, the attendee agrees that going fast um, polyps at any stage would be missed, but ultimately it's still user dependent, correct? A hundred percent. And so that's why, you know, it really should be just an adjunct, adjunctive tool. Um, you know, there's a kind of benchmark that we go by within gastroenterology, right? Like you need to have a withdrawal time from the very end of the um, colon to, to the exit of at least six minutes. And so if you're not even reaching that, then you can, you know, you're probably missing more polyps. So that's one thing. Um, and then kind of making sure that the surface is you're getting good mucosal exposure and cleaning the surface. Um, you know, if you don't have a good bowel prep, then you're going to conceal kind of those polyps and you're not, the AI isn't going to be able to pick up on it. Jessica Pan from the School of uh, Public Health, I assume, that's what that stands for, asks, how should payers be evaluating AI technology in your opinion? Is that for me? <laughs> you, go ahead. Either of you could answer it. Yeah, you know, this is um, it's such a new area that um, I know in other fields outside of GI, there are additional codes associated for billing purposes for AI additions. Not in gastroenterology yet, because it's still pretty recent, but there have been, you know, I know that at a local level, there can be negotiations made with the kind of private payers to say that if you're able to demonstrate that you're providing, you know, better quality care with the technology, that um, that there can be some sort of, you know, uh, preferred um, reimbursement model for practices that have the technology. Andrew, did you have any comments about that? Well, no, I, I think that's uh, a little bit out of my wheelhouse in terms okay. of insurance. <laughs> Fair enough. A last question about GI Genius, and then we'll go on to the other topics. Uh, Anish Shah asks, does GI Genius software work effectively in groups of patients with melanosis coli, which is just when the, the colon has more pigmentation than usual, so the coloring looks different? 
You know, that's a really good question. I don't know the direct answer to that. I'm going to look into it, but um, but I believe so, but I, I'll definitely have to look into that. All right, um, going on to other questions from, from our audience. Uh, specifically, this is for you, Andrew. They were, I think this was after you gave your presentation about your work, someone asked, have any of these techniques been used to detect pulmonary fibrosis? Uh, not yet. That you're aware of. Yeah, there, there is a separate group that is, uh, that is using some similar methods based on texture to study, uh, you know, fibrosis, but we, our group is mostly focused on, on, the, on, on COPD, but it could be all these, the reality is all these models are very sensitive to uh, the particular uh, appearance of that disease in the lung. And so once you change that, it's a, a different pattern, but I'm absolutely confident that if we had sufficiently large data sets as we do for COPD, we could probably train them all to, to work, to recognize it, yeah. You use the word training them and training the models. And someone asks when you speak of training the model, yeah. is the model an application a buyer of the model has specifically asked for? Where do these models come from? Is this something that's customizable? Can you all talk about that a little bit more? Well, there's there's generally two, there are many types of models, but in imaging, there's usually two types, a classification model where you could use a, uh, a convolutional neural network, or for that matter, a uh, multi-layered perceptron, which is the most basic or sort of primitive type model. Um, those are very good at classifying an object. So if you wanted to look at a, a brain scan to detect you know, tumors versus non-tumors in screening. You could, you know, that's been done very nicely with convolutional neural networks um, as, as well as multi-layered perceptrons. For more complex analysis, um, I didn't have time on my slide to show this, but, uh, you know, the, the classification models will tell you what is there, but it doesn't tell you localization. So uh, in 2015, there was a paper that proposed what's called a UNET, which uses a, a encoder decoder type model where it's probably the most popular framework for what's accomplishing image segmentation, which is a labeling of every pixel within an image matrix to a particular type. And actually there was a paper that just came out, I think last week where now, uh, this can the, the whole body can be labeled and, and, and segmented within a matter of of seconds actually so it's really you know once you train the model the computation of using those models is incredibly efficient because it's just the sum of the products of those weights as you stream the data through the pipeline um that's probably a little bit too too much of an answer but i i, I don't know if i answered I, I forgot what the original question was but yeah, I, th I think overall, just the, the theme of it was whether or not it's something that's customizable to the user. Like is, it, is the model created for the user or is, a, is there a model that is created and then users can can implement it in their systems? That, that's right, not right, right. They, right. They, they can execute that model once it's been defined. The reality is we don't understand. Someone asked, I think I saw a question about explainable AI. The reality is we're not at a point where we fully understand the multi-dimensionality of these models. And so we have hyperparameters that we can tweak in terms of the number of hidden layers, uh, what's the bandwidth of the, of the, you know, the horizontal number of, of neurons that are in the model, um, how, we how we cascade them uh, together. There are ex these are exciting times and there are very creative people that are building new models every day and then testing these models to optimize, uh, you know, torturosity of, of shapes, things that are very complex in order to segment and label. Um, so they are, but once they are done, uh, they exist as a, as the framework of that, of that model, plus the weights. The weights themselves really are the, are the magic sauce. That's what sort of 
a sort of patentable, you know, component there uh, on the actual value of those weights, because those will will uh, capture the generalization based upon the data that it was trained by. Awesome. I, I can sort of comment at least from my understanding of it, kind of in the, from the real time sort of device perspective. Um, you know, we have contracted centers that provide us with where we collect the images from. So it's not like every center that currently has the device is kind of actively getting every colonoscopy recorded and that plays into the algorithm. Um, these updates have to kind of be manually extracted and then like, you know, every so often there's a kind of system upgrade. Um, and I think part of the reason behind that is because like with every upgrade, there has to be a new FDA submission, at least that's how it currently is. So that's kind of why it's like not compatible with how the FDA currently structures their kind of device approvals. Um, so it's, uh, it's interesting. I, I, I think this may evolve over time um, in terms of like what sort of um, inputs are being, how, how, how the inputs are being um, I guess collected and and um, and put into train the model. Wonderful. Um, other questions for you are really about the future directions for artificial intelligence in healthcare. And I think we both you both spoke from the a clinical and uh, biomedical research space, but we're seeing more big firms get into the healthcare space with whether it's Google and DeepMind or uh, IBM with Watson Health, where, where are we headed and what are the things that you'd like to see in the near future? Andrew, you can take that first. Well, I think there's, uh, um, I, th I think the, the future, uh, of AI is is good. I think there's going to be more and more demonstrations of of improved uh, detection of disease and very concrete, hard hard evidence that uh, if we don't use these methods, we're being uh, not irresponsible, but I guess we're sort of ignoring the tool that is that we have on our table. Um, and so I believe that's true. I, I think Austin mentioned there are some issues regarding FDA and uh, regulatory policy that I think is still being worked on and optimized over time, but I'm convinced that'll, that'll work out as well. Uh, someone says there are two, it's a comment, says that there are two AI models, supervised and unsupervised. Most products currently do not contain unsupervised models and are supplied periodically by this vendor. Can you confirm that, comment on that? Yeah, yeah. so there's, yeah, there, uh, yeah, there's, um, there's also semi-supervised. Those are, in my mind, that's sort of how you train the model. I guess the model, I guess, in my mind is, is the actual network, the topology of the, how the input layers and the hidden layers and the output layers, so the stuff that's in between the input and output, I, I guess that that's what I interpreted this model. But those are, there are ways of training those models with supervised, meaning that you have ground truth data and you would use that to compare input data. And there's unsupervised learning, which is what we did in our lung uh, in, in our in our in our CPD study and the recognition of those ten new subtypes, that was a uh, unsupervised model. There was early early semi supervised. Semi supervised mean that you sort of you tell it some of the data as ground truth, but then you had maybe two thirds of it that's unsupervised. So those are tr methods of how you train a model. Austin, you had comments. No, I think that basically, uh, I think described what I was um, saying earlier, but um, kind of just to answer the question about future of AI, I mean, I think I, I don't know if that uh, attendee had um, heard kind of what we had mentioned earlier, but I think there's a lot of potential applications of AI, um, you know, not just in terms of image base, but also just improving clinical workflow and, you know, um, efficiency.
efficiency of how we practice medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, Billy Thomas asks, how much time does it take to train a model? And then another attendee asks, says more is always better. How much data is needed to train a model? Um, so I'll, I'll answer the last one first. <laughs> uh, yeah, the data, you know, it depends really on what you're targeting. If you're doing a classification problem, you know, you can get by with a few hundred uh, samples for training. Um, uh, there are methods that are, there are ways of training um, that are called one-shot vector training where you don't need much data uh, to do that. Uh, um, but with data augmentation, you usually can can generate, um, even from a sparse amount of data, a good size tr training set. Um, you know, we, if you have 500 exam examples, you're in pretty good shape for most classification problems and most segmentation um, um, tasks that you can envision in medical imaging. Um, Are there certain scenarios where, where less is more? Um, I, you know, I, I don't think so. And the person, you know, you want to generalize, these models want to generalize. And, and in my experience, the more data you present to the model, the better uh, capacity it has, is, has in terms of being able to, to generalize. Of course, the, the Achilles heel that I think you alluded to is there are unknown cases that may exist that are very rare, you know, that may never been included in the training set. And so, you know, the hope is that if those, if the generalization took place, it would discover those, but, you know, that's an open question. That's a weakness of, of, of uh, AI methods. That, that's why usually you're right, more is better because you're just increasing the number of cases that the model has seen. Austin, I actually have a, I, 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 I have a question for you. I kind of actually have a question for Andrew because I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of like barriers for AI in the future, you know, especially in rare conditions, you know, how do we go about that? Because there may be, you know, not enough data to even input. Yeah, there, uh, as I mentioned, there are models that exist that uh, can do a pretty good job with a small amount of data and radiology. Um, this has been shown to be the case. Uh, I don't recall the paper off, offhand, but several years ago, it was quite a nice demonstration that you don't need, you don't need big data all the time. You can, you can actually train the model with uh, a, a small amount of data. Um, the, but it depends on what you're asking the model to do. If it's binary classification, yes, no, that's doable. Uh, if it's you know, s segmenting a uh, hippocampus that has a large, large, is a bit challenging in 3D, that may not be possible with a small set. Austin, we have a question for you. When it comes to AI and misdiagnosis, who's on the hook? That's a great question. I don't think anyone really knows the answer to that at the moment. Um, you know, is that that is a question that has come up. You know, is it is it going to be on AI? Is it going to be on the vendor, or is it going to be on the physician? And I feel like it's just it's probably situation dependent. Yeah. How are you, or how are you, or other companies that you know of, kind of position positioning yourself within that conversation? Um, you know, that's a, that's a, <laughs> it's a tough question to answer, especially kind of speaking from, with the Medtronic hat on, um, you know, right now, all we can say is that it's, you know, an assistive technology and, um, and so ultimately I think that it still requires the expertise of the physician, but, you know, I, I definitely want to be careful about like how I word that. That's understandable. Yeah. 
All right, last question. And then I just want to get some uh, last comments from you guys about any thoughts that you feel is important for our viewers at home to know. Um, and we, we talked about just now, more is more when it comes to especially deep learning models. But someone asked, don't you need balanced training sets? And what happens when you have an imbalance? Yeah, yeah. So I think that's the question of the bias. So uh, I said you can get rid of uh, bias in AI. So one way to do that is you can augment the data. So if you had sort of two two groups, one was very very large in size, the other population was very small. One way to then that would be a bias data set, right? So you wouldn't want to train on that. And so there are tools in AI where we can augment the smaller size data set to make it you know almost as large as the other the other samples the other population so that's uh, that's one way that bias can be can be coped with within a deep learning model uh, thank you and i'll have andrew if you could just share with us your final thoughts what you feel the audience needs to know about artificial intelligence in healthcare well, I'm I'm biased already because I have a I have a you know I've been working in this field myself, so I'm very excited about it. Um, but I think the you know the as the poem goes, the best is yet to come. I, I think there's uh, uh, there's a lot of opportunity, but we also have to be cautious. I think that's the uh, you know proceed, um, but proceed with caution and be you know be mindful of of you know patient pr privacy and um as we move forward with these methods we'll have to work together to resolve those those issues there's there's a lot of unknowns that, that we need to face together austin any final thoughts from you i'm also very excited i think that there's we're just at the beginning especially in our field um i think healthcare in general in terms of actual uh clinical applications you know generally from what i understand we're still pretty early um and and so i'm i'm optimistic but also cautiously optimistic and i hope that you know this isn't kind of a um a temporary fad i think that you know from our society to our individual um practitioners we have to keep the conversation going and um and hopefully that'll you know keep this um this field evolving. I want to thank you both for the time that you spent with us tonight and just all the insights that you gave us about artificial intelligence within the field of healthcare. I know that tonight we had people from all schools within Columbia, MIT, and Harvard and with different backgrounds, whether it's health or outside of healthcare. And I think you both did a great job of breaking it down into bits that were digestible. And I agree, I think there are a lot of problems within medicine that we've been trying to figure out for a long time. And now there is this tool that's powerful and can help us do that, but it's flaw flawed. As we try to figure out ways to help responsibly develop AI systems to help all our patients. So thank you again. Uh, we look forward to seeing more from both of you in the near future within this space. Um, and I wanna thank all of you who joined us from home tonight. We will have a link for YouTube if you wish to rewatch any of it. Someone asked about the articles that were mentioned. We'll try to get those names out as well. Thank sure. you all. And Th have thank day. you. Thank you. Thank you.